Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Jerry Zack from UCLA. Um, uh, in vivo suppression of HIV and melanoma by antigen-specific T cells derived from engineered hematopoietic stem cells. That's Jerry, a thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, this will be a little bit different. I'm going to talk um, about some studies we're doing to try to engineer immune responses um, in human cells. And basically, <clears throat> this is based on the idea that for, for many, many years we've known if you take a pre-rearranged immune receptor, like a um, B cell receptor or a T cell receptor, and make a transgenic mouse out of it, you'll get a, a functioning um, a mature immune system down the road that basically expresses that receptor. So uh, basically what we want to do is see if we can do a transgenic approach um, in a human system. Could we enhance human immune responses to antigens? Um, and basically this is based on the idea that a uh, hematopoietic progenitor can lead to all the different lineages um, in the blood system. Importantly, all this differentiation happens in the bone marrow with the exception of T cell development, which, which occurs in the thymus. So I'm going to talk a little bit of science fiction at the end of the talk about um, converting embryonic stem cells into hematopoietic progenitors to try to do this. But initially what I'm going to do is introduce you to the idea of, of putting uh, genes for a class 1 restricted T cell receptor into hematopoietic progenitors. Because it's class 1 restricted, it should essentially be expressed in CD8 cells if humans behave the same as mice. And if we're lucky, we'll get cytotoxic T cells um, specific for that uh, antigen that is uh, attacked by that particular receptor. So we're working in two systems, HIV and melanoma, and these are the guys that are doing it. Scott Kitchen um, is starting his own lab now at UCLA, and Demetrius is just about to start his own lab at UCLA. <clears throat> and essentially, I'll, I'll show you data with two different receptors. We have one TCR uh, specific for the SL9 epitope of GAG, um, and we have another one that's specific for the MART1 um, uh, protein antigen, which is essentially, uh, MART1 is involved in melanin synthesis, so it's expressed in melanoma. So it's a self-antigen, but um, we have a T-cell receptor specific for that. We have a couple of those, but I'm going to be talking about one uh, called F5, which we received from the Rosenberg lab at the NCI. And essentially, our constructs are basically lenny-viral vectors that express um, both the alpha and beta chain of the T-cell receptors, separated by a 2A site, so we can, we can express both simultaneously. There's an IRAS, and then there's usually a reporter. It, in this particular case, GFP, but it doesn't have to be. We have pet reporters and other things in our different constructs. But importantly, both TCRs I'm going to talk about will be restricted to HLA A2.01, which is found in about 40% of Caucasians. So it's the most highly um, represented uh, class 1 molecule, so it makes it a lot easier to study if you have a T cell receptor restricted to a common molecule. Now, when, when T cells develop in the thymus, they have to go through several steps um, of differentiation and uh, proliferation. Importantly, they go through steps called positive and negative selection. So in positive selection, um, they are trained to see um, HLA molecules expressed in the thymus. If the T cell receptor doesn't bind to HLA molecules, the cells die, failing positive selection. So importantly, all our TCRs are restricted to HLA A2.1. So in our system, we have to have HLA-A2.1 in the thymus or our cells will fail positive selection. Um, subsequently, the cells undergo negative selection. If they bind that T-cell, the, the T-cell receptor binds the HLA molecules too tightly, the cell kills itself and, and dies, it basically fails um, negative selection. Now, during this whole um, scheme, uh, the cells also go through a process called lineage commitment. So initially, they're double positive for both CD4 and CD8. They have to decide to become either a CD4 single positive cell or a CD8 single positive cell. And that largely depends on their interaction with MHC or, or in this case HLA molecules. And at least in the mouse system, if this, the TCRs interact with class 1, the cells become CD8 positive. If they interact with class 2, the cells commit to CD4. And basically we're testing to see if that happens in the human system as well. <clears throat> so the model we're using is a BLT mouse, which was talked about, so I'm not really going to go into it. But the bottom line is we get beautiful peripheral reconstitution in this system, um, and it has a human thymus, so it works for, for our studies. So we've adapted the model um, further than what Garcia's lab published. We basically take an NSG um, where we, we transplant tissues into the NSG mouse, but what we do, we take the fetal liver, um, sort out the CD34s, save the, the um, stromal elements as well. 
we transduce the CD34s with our Lenny vector and split them into two pools. Um, one pool gets frozen, the other pool gets mixed back with the fetal liver stroma um, and with a piece of um, fetal thymus in a major gel plug, which we then put under the kidney capsule. So this major gel plug just keeps everything together in a nice happy little gamish. Um, so we basically make a thigh leave implant with transduced CD34s and then come in subsequently with the other aliquot of the uh, transduced CD34s IV and that sets up the, um, the system. <clears throat> So just showing you the HIV um, system first, this is, uh, we have a tetramer reagent that will pick up cells that are positive for this TCR. So you can see that TCR positive cells are expressed in the bone marrow, thymus, spleen, liver, and peripheral blood of these animals. They basically go all through the mice. If we now test for infection, we can infect these animals with, with a uh, reporter strain of virus, which has engineered into the VPR region a, um, a surface molecule called CD, uh, CD24. Um, it's also called HSA. It's a murine molecule. And attached to that, we also have an influenza HA tag. So we can actually stain for HA and, and detect cells that are produ productively infected with the virus. So we have um, our mice have, uh, some animals have a TCR that's a control TCR. So it's not HIV specific. It's specific for something, but we don't know exactly what it's specific for, but not HIV. And so here we're going to compare uninfected mice with um, animals introduced with control TCRs and animals receiving stem cells having the SL9 TCR, looking for uh, production of, of uh, virally productive cells in the blood. And you can basically see at the six weeks time point, the antiviral TCR has reduced the level of um, productively infected cells compared to control TCRs. There is some splay, but it is statistically significant. If we now look for um, CD4 ratios or CD4 cells in the blood, you can see compared to control TCRs, which have depleted CD4s, the uh, animals largely with the um, SL9 TCR have protected CD4 numbers. <clears throat> and if we look at plasma viral load, again at the six week time point, we see about a 20 fold drop, this is a log scale, about a 20 fold drop in circulating virus um, with the single TCR put into stem cells and then this allowed to go through to CD8 single positives. Interestingly, when we checked for resistance, this is at the six week time point, um, we didn't see any mutation in the uh, SL9 epitope during the six weeks uh, of this experiment. I can't explain that. We figured we'd get resistance and escape, but we did not, so um, I don't know exactly why. Um, I wouldn't argue using a single TCR for a therapy, but um, uh, so we, we have multiple TCRs, but basically, in, at least in this study, we, we did not see any um, escape. So we asked whether um, these TCRs would go into the tissues and affect viral load in the tissues. So in this particular experiment, we're looking for proviral DNA. So it's not a perfect assay, but looking for proviral DNA in tissues. And again, you can see at the six-week time point, we have decreases in proviral DNA in the spleen, the uh, bone marrow, and in the thymus compared to control uh, treated animals. So it looks like these TCRs are getting into the tissues and killing productively infected cells there as well. So what about some immune parameters? We've checked for... Um, markers of development on these cells. And here we're staining <clears throat> or gating on tetramer positive cells from uninfected and infected mice and basically staining for CD45 RA and CCR7 to look for um, naive and effector function. And essentially in uninfected animals, the cells basically retain a naive phenotype, but in infected animals, they lose that naive phenotype and, and take on an effector memory phenotype. Um, I'm not gonna show you everything in this panel, but, but bottom line, the cells proliferate in response to antigen. Control cells do not proliferate. So once you infect, you get expansion of these um, TCR-bearing cells. And the level of reconstitution that we see initially before infection, the higher the reconstitution correlates with a better, better protection. So animals that had low levels of reconstitution had higher viral loads at the end of the experiment. Animals with high levels of reconstitution had lower viral loads. So it seems to correlate with the level of transduction or um, of take we have of this TCR. Okay, shifting gears into the cancer system. So um, here's a cohort of eight mice just looking at the frequency of the anti-melanoma TCR in the periphery. So we're staining for CD8 cells in this direction and a tetramer for the um, MART-specific TCR in this direction. So these big numbers tell you the percent of, of human CD8s that express the anti-melanoma TCR. And essentially, in this particular experiment, it ranges from about 4% to over 40% of, of the human CD8s in the periphery express this T cell receptor. 
which gave us enough frequency to, to, to do in vivo efficacy, efficacy studies. So what Demetrius did <clears throat> is he took each animal that he reconstituted with transduced stem cells, excuse me, and transplanted two tumors into each mouse. Um, one of them, well, both were melanomas, so they both expressed the MART epitope. But this particular tumor is HLA-A2.1 positive. That's the restricting um, HLA molecule. And this guy is HLA-A2.1 negative. So this will uh, serve as a target for the CTLs, and this will be an internal control. So each animal is controlled um, internally with, with a, with a non-responsive tumor. Essentially what we do is we, um, we can look for direct CTL activity in splenocytes at sacrifice. We can um, use um, PET scanning to pulse the animals with radio-labeled glucose precursor, which looks at metabolic activity of the tumors itself, so we can look at changes in tumor metabolic activity. And we also have a um, PET reporter in the virus, so we can look um, with FHPG imaging to see where our cells are going in these mice. So here we're looking at just taking cells out of the spleen, looking for direct cytotoxic T cell activity by chromium release without any additional ex vivo manipulations. They're just straight out of the spleen. And so you can see the cells have lytic activity coming right out of the spleen, suggesting that the tumors themselves are priming the cells in vivo. If we look for where their cells are going, this is just taking biopsies of the tissue in this panel and counting um, tetramer positive cells. So the dark bars are representing the number of cells around the targeted tumor, and the light bars are, the, are looking at the number of uh, tetramer positive cells around the non-targeted tumor. And you can basically see that there's more cells around the targeted tumor than the non-targeted, at least in these three mice. And here we're using our PET scanning technique to see where those cells are going. So essentially, cells that are containing our, um, expressing our reporter are homing around the targeted tumor much more than around the non-targeted tumors. Okay, so it looks like our cells are trafficking to tumors like they're supposed to. Um, we then did PET scanning to look at tumor size. And this mouse is supposed to spin. He didn't spin this morning. I think he's jet lagged, but I'm gonna, I'll, 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 I know I am. I'll, I'll try to explain. So this is the mouse, for those of you who are MDs, this is what a mouse looks like when you PET scan it. This is brain, bladder, this is probably gut. This is tumor. Um, this is muscle up here. So when the mice are um, put in the PET scanner, they're in these little tubes, and they, they don't like it, so they go like this. So their triceps light up a little bit with, this, with the probe. But this is tumor. Um, and there's another tumor that's supposed to be here. And if the mouse spins right, you'll see that the tumor is gone. Yeah, he's jet lagged. Okay, take my word for it. There's supposed to be a tumor here, but it's gone. Um, graphically represented, though, um, these are, this is metabolic activity of, of the tumors as judged by PET scanning. These are in mice that have received the anti-melanoma TCR. Here's controls. And you can see down here these four tumors completely cleared. And of the nine total, six of the nine are below all of the control tumors. So it looks like we're getting statistically significant decreases in tumor mass, um, at least as judged by metabolic activity, um, in, these, uh, in the tumors that were attacked by our transgenic uh, stem cell drive T cells. If we correlate, uh, sorry, let me back up a little bit. So these three guys seem to have escaped this response. If we try to figure out why, that again correlates with the amount of reconstitution. So the greater amount of cytotoxic activity we had in the spleens, the more decrease in tumor mass we had. And the greater number of tetramer positive cells we had in the periphery, the smaller the mass of the tumor. So again, the, the, the immune response correlates with the amount of reconstitution we have of mature transduced cells in the periphery. OK, I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, and talk about some unpublished data. We've done a bunch of molecular characterization to determine if introduction of these transgenic TCRs um, stops rearrangement of endogenous T cell receptors. So, so does allelic exclusion operate? And to save time, I won't show all the molecular stuff. We do see some decrease in TREX, about 50%. We see a decrease in expression of endogenous TCR um, beta chains by about 50%, but not by 100%. But what I will show you, if we stain for other V-beta subfamilies on the surface of cells, um, in this particular case, we're looking for V-beta 9, which is not the, the subset that our TCR has. And we're, we're looking for tetramer in this direction. We've done this with several different, uh, four or five different V-beta subfamilies. Essentially, you don't see co-expression of the two, uh, of the, the tetramer with another V-beta in any 
of this animals we've looked at. So at least at the protein level, it's not 100% at the, at the molecular level, but at the protein level, we restrict expression of endogenous TCRs if you put a transgenic TCR into stem cells and allow them to mature into um, functional peripheral cells. Okay, so now for the science fiction part. Um, this is Zoran Galich. He's been working in the melanoma system to try to develop um, human embryonic stem cells into hematopoietic progenitors and then subsequently develop them into functional T cells. Um, this is not a melanoma growing out of his head. I, I <laughs> don't exactly know what it is, but um, it seems to have metastasized down here too. <laughs> anyway, so that's Zoran. He's um, working in this system. And the, the, the basic idea here is to try to transduce ES cells with these TCRs and get them to be functional. So why would we want to do this? The idea is you can, you can culture ES cells, or, or in theory IPS cells, indefinitely, um, and they remain pluripotent. So you can do lots of genetic manipulation if you so choose. You can characterize them. In, in theory, you can clone them out, and you can look for integration sites so you could prevent a vector integrating near a site that would be deleterious. And in theory, you can grow tons of these guys so you can get adequate quantities of, of the material so then you could then subsequently differenti differentiate them and transfer them into subjects if you wanted to treat. So Zoran's been working in that system. And essentially what he does is he takes a Lenny Fowler vector, and he's been doing this for about five years now, and it's finally just started to work. And I don't know why it didn't work before. It should have worked in the first place, but it didn't. He puts the vector into ES cells um, or into IPS cells. IPS are much less efficient. Um, the, the ES line we found to be the most efficient is, is the H1 line. Um, you can see that you get expression of the TCR, so this is the alpha chain expressed within the ES cell. Um, it doesn't change the pluripotency of the cell, but it's not expressed on the surface because the cells don't express CD3, so it's just it's, it's intracellular. He can then um, differentiate these cells in vitro um, using embryoid bodies into hematopoietic progenitors, which now are just injected directly into a thymic implant in an old-style skid hue, not a BLT, just an old-style skid hue. And then we look for GFP-positive cells because we have GFP on our vector that are expressing um, the tetramer. So here's uh, one example of GFP-positive cells in our thymus. So most of the cells are not resultant from the ES cells, but a subset are. You can gate on them. Uh, the vast majority of those are, are TCR-positive as judged by tetramer staining. And if you look for a phenotypic analysis, CD4 and CD8, most of them are double positive because these are coming from the thymus. They're immature. But you can start to see some sneaking down towards CD8 single positivity, exclusion of CD4 single positivity, suggesting that they're committing appropriately along the lineage commitment line, because this is also a class 1 restricted TCR. Um, we further either, I'm not sure if we differentiated them or selected for CD8 single positives, but basically we culture these guys on APCs that are A2 positive and had the uh, Mart 1 peptide on them. And after a little while, we get CD8 single positive cells. If we look for interferon gamma expression, they're all expressing interferon gamma and, and the TCR, so suggesting that the TCR is functioning within those cells. If we do a standard chromium release assay, we can see that um, these cells are lytic for K562s that have been pulsed with um, MART peptide. And if you similarly put that exogenous TCR into peripheral um, PBMC, they're lytic also. So we're not doing a head-to-head -head comparison, but bottom line, the TCR works in peripheral cells and it works in T cells derived from ES if you do a standard chromium release. If you now put these guys onto um, a monolayer of melanoma cells, so these are melanoma cells, the fibroblast-like looking cells, that are MART positive but not HLA A2, A2 positive, so they're not targets. The green are, the, are GFP positive T cells. These guys just sit there and don't do much. If you put them on a monolayer of A2.1 positive targets, you can see the T cells seem to be forming clumps, and it looks like you've lysed most of the melanoma cells. And I'm hoping this works. So this is a video showing green uh, ES-derived T cells um, sitting down onto red melanoma cells. OK, this guy's not jet lagged. So you can see they all kind of clump in, and it looks like the melanoma cells are being killed. And if we hone in, again, this is a GFP positive T cell. This is a melanoma cell. You can see he little T cell gets on there, crawls around, and then decides it's going to kill it. And right there, it lyses the cell and, and basically kills it. So it looks like these guys are, are fully functional, able to express T cell receptors and kill their targets um, 
after being derived from an embryonic stem cell. So there you go. I think I did it within my time frame. So what I'm supposed to have shown you is that human hematopoietic progenitors can develop into CD8-positive cytotoxic T cells if we, produce, if we introduce a class one restricted T cell receptor into that hematopoietic progenitor. Um, I didn't show you this, but it absolutely requires the restricting HLA molecule. In the absence of HLA-A2.1, we never get CD8 single positive cells that express the TCR. Um, we've generated both anti-HIV and anti-melanoma T cells in this fashion. Um, we can find these transgenic, now the mature cells can be found in the periphery in multiple tissues, uh, bone marrow, thymus, spleen, peripheral blood, gut. Um, they're functional. They can counter either virus in vivo, depending on their specificity, or tumor growth in vivo. Um, I didn't show you these data, but they appear to be stable in the marrow. We can find at sacrifice the um, CD34s are still there and expressing vectors, so we assume this would then be a long-term um, stable reconstitution. Um, I didn't show you all the data, but endogenous T cell receptor expression is restricted in transgenic cells. So the advantage of this approach, as opposed to putting in uh, TCRs into peripheral cells, is in peripheral cells you have an, uh, expression of endogenous TCRs. If you throw an exogenous TCR in, you're now going to get four chains with different combinations and the chance to recombine and potentially give you autoimmunity. In this particular case, where allelic exclusion is operating partially at the molecular level, probably partially at protein expression as well, um, to restrict expression of endogenous TCRs, so we just have a single specificity on our transgenic cells. And um, our recent data show that you can, we can similarly engineer human embryonic stem cells, and by inference, IPS, but they're less efficient, um, with these TCRs and, and generate functional T cells. Problematic, though, is, is these guys are at least 100-fold less efficient than hematopoietic progenitors. So I don't think we're going to be running the clinic in the, in the near future um, with uh, ES cell-derived therapies, but, um, but possibly with hematopoietic progenitor cell-derived therapies. So let me um, thank my collaborators. Uh, Scott Kitchen did all the work with the HIV TCRs, Demetrius with the melanoma TCR in vivo, and Zoran did the uh, ES work with the melanoma TCR. Um, Otto Yang and Harris Goldstein provided HIV-specific TCRs. And we have this massive engineered immunity consortium um, really run by David Baltimore at Caltech and Owen Witte at UCLA, who's been providing us with TCRs for melanoma and with melanoma cells and with cancer expertise, because Lord knows I know nothing about melanoma. I know something about mice, though, so that's why I'm involved in this. But we get, we get most of our melanoma stuff from this uh, consortium that's been quite helpful to us. And I'll stop there and take any questions. Thanks. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, take questions. Uh, Jeremy. Amazing, amazing, Jerry. <clears throat> um, as, as you know, I probably you guys and many others have had trouble getting expression of transgenes when they're put into the CD34s. Um, so apparently this matrigel mix that you use is really critical. Could, could you comment on that? What, what yeah. do you think is going on? <clears throat> so uh, the matrigel mix is, is basically just like a glue because we separate out the CD34s and the stroma, and we don't want them to come sliding out from the kidney capsule, so we basically just stick them in this jelly matrix, matrigel, which holds them in place, um, the CD34s and the stroma together, and the thymus in the same place, and then allows them to basically fuse and form a thylium implant. So without the matrigel, I don't think it would work at all, or at least not, not as efficiently as it does here. Did that answer your question? No, no, I don't think the matrix gel does anything except hold the transduced cells in position so that they can fuse into the thymic implant and set up shop. I think it's just a physical, um, uh, physical means of keeping the cells together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering if uh, these ES transgenic TCR cells, do they develop normal memory? I have no idea. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I would like to thank you for showing to audi audi auditory how well and how good are humanized mice and how well they can be used, especially for HIV, because you showed very nice control of viral replication. Did you have chance to look on the tissue and how many infected cells stay in the tissue in this system? 
um, we, we only looked by PCR for proviral DNA. Um, we did not look histologically for productively infected cells. We could, but we didn't do that. And what do you think your engineered TCR specific, HIV specific cells, are they different from natural who not able to lyse infected <clears throat> cells? Hmm. Um, the one thing that would make these superior to naturally stimulated cells is that in theory, if you did this in a, in, a, in a human subject, you would continuously put out in the naive cells out in the periphery that had the TCR. So if exhaustion was coming into play because of high viral load, you would be rearming with fresh cells um, continuously. And I think that's an advantage of this approach over a peripheral approach or, or just letting um, cells that are already in the periphery expand. They shouldn't get, um, they shouldn't get quiescent or um, I'm jet lagged. Okay. Exhausted. I'm exhausted. They shouldn't get exhausted <laughs> because of high viral load as quickly because fresh cells are being put out. And do you believe it can eradicate HIV, this approach? Um, I'm hoping so. I think with enough TCRs or a, a wise approach of targeting TCRs to epitopes that are not, that are, um, not easily mutatable might work. Um, Thank you. Alternatively, it can be used as an ancillary therapy as well. Thank yeah. you. Those transgenic T cells, won't they need any co-stimulatory molecules for their action, as what happens in the normal phase? Yeah, they certainly do respond to co-stimulation. Um, now, in the mice, there's human APCs, so we assume they're getting co-stimulation from the human APCs in the mice. Um, I haven't documented that, but I think that's probably what's going on. Um, there, there, there are differences in terms of efficacy of CTL that can be traced back to the individual TCR that's being uh, the TCR clonotype. And um, uh, so I, I guess one question in terms of the lack of, of immune selection pressure that's being mediated through that A2 response, although you're seeing a 20% a drop or 20-fold drop in, um, in viral load, um, may, maybe the efficacy of that response is, is suboptimal. Um, also, I think in humans it takes a while for those mutations to, to actually arise. But I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Um, there could be several things. One, maybe we didn't wait long enough. Um, we ended the experiment at six weeks because we have this GVH issue that ha happens around that time. So we tend to stop the experiment at that point so we don't have GVH influence it. Um, the other is it could be that SL9 provides a more fit virus in vivo. Um, in fact, NL43 doesn't have the SL9 epitope. We had to engineer it in mm -hmm. to make it a target, but it seems to go perfectly well. So it could be that that's just a better virus. So it, it, um, it, it outgrows even though there might be escape mutants that are there. So we just we don't know that for a fact yet. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, so the, the last speaker in this, uh, in this morning's session on HIV-specific immunity in humanized mice is from uh, Judy Chang from the Reagan Institute, Immune Activation in the Role of TLR and TLR Agonists in the Control of HIV. So I'd like to firstly thank the organizers uh, for giving this opportunity to present some of the data we have um, using the BLT mice. So I'm actually going to shift the focus a little bit um, and um, examine the immune activation in HIV infection. I'm going to just give a brief overview as to the importance of um, immune activation and um, in particular um, focus on the TLRs or toll-like receptors, which are innate immune receptors that recognize microbial and viral products and how um, stimulation of this pathway is an important contributor to this immune activation. And then, of course, using this as our question, how we can utilize the humanized mouse model as a small animal model to examine and also manipulate the innate immune responses in the hopes of reducing immune activation and disease progression. So 
even in the era of heart, um, we see that heart has been great in terms of in improving the life expectancy of HIV infected individuals. And this is even sh um, better now with um, the better latest treatment combinations. However, as you can see here, um, the life ex expectancy is um, still not comparable to what's um, found in HIV uninfected individuals. So. What is interesting is that um, a lot of the diseases associated with this mobility in these patients are actually not AIDS related, and they actually include um, simply higher rates of um, common diseases um, that cause mobility, such as cardiovascular disease, um, cancer, neuropathogenesis, and um, liver and kidney failures. And of course, there may be several factors that contribute to this higher rate of, of these diseases, and these could include um, lifestyle choices, such as the use of injecting drugs, as well as the toxicity of the antiretrovirals themselves. However, evidence has now shown that immune activation is also an important contributor to these various diseases. So how is immune activation associated with HIV? Well, we can probably take some clues from the um, SIV infection in primates. So the Sudi mangabees are the uh, natural hosts of SIV, and uh, when they're infected, they have high levels of um, SIV viral loads. Um, but despite this, they have um, no symptoms of AIDS and um, a normal lifespan. Um, on the other hand, the rhesus macaques, which are the non-natural hosts of SIV, they also get infected and also have high viral loads, but contrarily to the Sudi mangabees, they have symptoms of AIDS and eventual morbidity. And the other sort of major differences observed between these um, two primates in SIV infection is that the pseudomangabees have minimal immune activation levels, whereas the rhesus macaques have high levels of immune activation, suggesting that immune activation is a strong factor associated and contributing to disease progression. So likewise, in human HIV infection, um, um, groups have observed that um, HIV um, infected individuals have higher levels of immune activation. This is shown here by activation of both uh, CD4 as well as CD8 T cells, and this is in comparison of, to HIV uninfected individuals. So, of course, with um, the uh, advent of antiretroviral therapies, treatment of um, HIV helps reduce this T cell activation. However, it still remains significantly higher than in uninfected individuals. So what are the mechanisms, um, both uh, microbial and HIV itself, that might be contributing to this immune activation? So the sort of one mechanism that I'm sort of focusing on is uh, this family of toll-like receptors. So these are innate immune receptors that uh, recognize micro various microbial as well as uh, viral products, so CBG DNA as well as single-stranded RNA. And um, stimulation through these TLRs in various cell types induces a cascade of cytokines and then subsequently the activation of various adaptive immune responses. So uh, one uh, particular TLR, TLR4, has been well characterized to um, recognize LPS and be especially important in driving immune activation in HIV infection. So um, Jason Brenchley and um, Danny Dueck have shown that during HIV infection, the barriers in the gut deteriorate, and there's an increase in microbe and microbial products that translocate into the circulation. And they showed that um, in uh, HIV chronically infected individuals, and particularly individuals who have AIDS, that there's a higher level of LPS detected within the plasma. And um, similarly, in the rhesus macaques that are the non-natural hosts, so the, the primates that had um, disease progression, there was also elevated levels of LPS in the plasma as compared um, to the uninfected macaques. And what they observed was that this um, LPS plasma level was directly correlated with T cell activation. So this is an example of how microbes can be driving this immune activation. but um, does HIV itself drive it? Well, um, the TLR7 and 8, which recognize um, single-stranded RNA, are actually able to recognize uh, the RNAs encoded for by HIV. And um, the, they both recognize single-stranded RNA, but TLR7s um, in humans are predominantly expressed on PDCs, which is a predominant producer of interferon alpha, um, and whereas the TLR8s are expressed on uh, MDCs and monocytes. 
Um, and our group, as well as uh, several other groups, have now shown that HIV encodes for several um, uh, ligands within its genome that are able to stimulate both TLR7 and TLR8. So once HIV is endocytosed by PDCs, the single-stranded RNA is exposed and this stimulates via the TLR7 receptor in PDCs um, to induce the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha, but also um, the uh, very important interferon alpha cytokine. And both of these um, have um, the capabilities of then contributing to immune activation. So using um, AT2 inactivated HIV virus, we previously um, showed that uh, when you stimulate um, PBMCs in vitro with this virus, that there is uh, increase in interferon alpha production as compared to the vesicle controls. And this was true in both males and females, with the females producing much more interferon alpha. And what we observed was this was um, occurring at the same time was that T cell activation levels was also stimulated by the AT2 virus. And again, we see that the association of higher interferon alpha was also associated with higher levels of T cell activation, um, suggesting that the induction of uh, TLR7 responses in PDCs is contributing to immune activation. So if we can suppress this TLR stimulation, can we then potentially reduce the immune activation observed in HIV-infected individuals? So to address this, we um, decided to utilize the humanized mouse model. And um, Andy has already shown how this mice was reconstituted, and he provided the mice for us, so I will not cover that. Um, but what we wanted to do was first ascertain that the cells we were interested in, so the innate immune cells, were there, and that they are actually able to respond to the TLRs as we observe in humans. So um, using cells collected from the humanized mice, peripheral blood, lymph node, and spleen, we um, gated on, um, we gated out mouse cells, which as determined by mouse CD45 expression, as well as human T cells, B cells, and NK cells as um, identified by CD3, CD19, and CD56. We then gated on HIDR positive cells and then identified um, PDCs, which are expressing CD123. Um, MDCs, which um, express CD11C and do not express CD14, and then also monocytes, which express both MDC, uh, CD11C as well as CD14. So indeed, we were able to identify um, the innate immune receptor, uh, innate immune cells in these BLT mouse model. So just to break down the various compartments um, that we examined, each of the cell population was differentially distributed in these three compartments. Uh, with the MDCs predominantly um, found within the spleen, but also um, observed in the lymph node and uh, PBMC compartments. Uh, the mon monocytes were predominantly in the lymph nodes, and then the PDCs was again uh, predominantly in the spleen. So in the subsequent experiments, though, we combined um, the cells collected from all three of these compartments so that each of the cell types was represented in the in vitro experiments. So um, we were lucky enough to come in contact with Idera Pharmaceuticals um, that provided an a antagonist that was specific to TLR7 and TLR9, but does not um, inhibit TLR8. And um, they are developing this antagonist for use in autoimmune disease and have already um, used it in uh, um, a phase one human clinical trial for safety. So we know it is um, safe in healthy individuals. Um, so we also then tested then in vitro if this um, antagonist was able to block uh, PDC st um, stimulation via the TLR7. And so using, this is human PBMCs from humans, um, we stimulated with either a synthetic um, TLR7-8 ligand, CL97, or the HIV-encoded single-stranded RNA. Um, and um, when we stimulated with um, these, either of these ligands, we saw um, cytokine production in human cells. And then in the presence of treatment with this antagonist, there was a significant reduction of um, the cytokines produced. 
So here's the um, BLT mouse data. And so likewise, the BLT mouse, we identified the, the PDCs were present. And um, fortunately, they were also able to respond to this TLR7 stimulation and produce interferon alpha as well as TNF alpha. And then uh, when we treated in vitro with the antagonist, we saw inhibition of the cytokine responses um, in the mouse. So as I mentioned, the um, ligands used here are able to stimulate both TLR7 as well as TLR8, but the antagonist um, only inhibits the TLR7 uh, pathway. So we examined in MDCs which express TLR8 but not TLR7 to see if the antagonist was specific. And so we can see that um, cytokine is induced by the ligands um, and that the antagonist doesn't inhibit this. So indeed, the, the antagonist is specific. So I just wanted to give this as an example of what the, the samples looks like. So these are um, gauges on PDCs. And um, as you can see, these are, these are BLT mouse samples. So that in the uh, presence of the CL97 stimulation, we get um, interferon alpha and TNF alpha production. But when the uh, cells were pretreated uh, for one hour with antagonist, we no longer see the cytokine production. So th these experiments are in vitro, and also the cells are pretreated for one hour with the antagonist. Um, but how effective is the antagonist if the ligand is already there, as would be in the setting of a chronic HIV infection? So we then uh, ran a time course to see if it was actually effective if the ligand was already present. So this is without the antagonist. Um, the uh, interferon alpha is detected um, by PDCs after cell nice stimulation. If we pretreated the samples with a one hour of the antagonist, we see a complete um, inhibition of the TLR7 ligand stimulation interferon alpha production. However, if we then um, stimulated first with the ligand and then came in with the antagonist, we see that um, at um, 15 minutes um, post-stimulation that the, the antagonist inhibition is no longer complete. However, it does plateau off after 30 minutes of um, stimulation. So um, even though the antagonist is not as effective if it's administered after ligand is already present, uh, you can still see that there is still a significant reduction in uh, the interferon alpha um, stimulation um, in, in PDCs. So knowing that the antagonist um, does work and that we have the innate immune cells in these BLT mice and they're able to stimulate, um, be stimulated through the TLR pathways, we then proceeded to look at um, how this can be utilized in an in vivo model. So um, we have BLT mice that we collected blood pre-infection um, as our baseline samples. And then we infected uh, with the JRCSF strain of the HIV. And this is um, similar to the methodologies um, shown by both Andy and Todd. And um, then we collected samples um, post-infection but pre-treatment. And then in a subset of um, the mice, we then came in with the antagonist treatment. And this was a once a week um, treatment and then uh, during this treatment period, um, there was four further uh, samples collected, and these are all blood samples. And then at nine weeks of infection, the mouse was sacrificed, and then we collected tissue at this time point. So the data I'm going to show you is the um, combined results of three batches of um, BLT mice. So um, all the mice were infected, and uh, following um, HIV infection, we have a high increase in the HIV viral load as um, previously shown with this model. Um, the dotted line shows the initiation of the treatment, and you can see between the two uh, mouse groups, there was actually no effect on HIV viral load. Now, the antagonist, as I said, is designed to specifically inhibit TLR7. It has no known antiretroviral um, properties, so we didn't sort of expect that there would be an effect on HIV viral load. What we were more interested in was um, how it might be affecting immune activation. So following HIV infection, we see that there is an increase 
in um, CD4 T cell activation. And this is similar to seeing humans. Um, and then um, we started treatment. And uh, in red is the mice that um, were uh, in vivo treated with the TLR79 antagonist. And we observed that um, it helped maintain a lower level of immune activation in the antagonist treated mice. And that this was significantly lower in the antagonist treated mice at weeks uh, six and week seven of um, infection as compared to the mice that um, were not given the antagonists. So then we also looked at CD8 T cell activation. Again, HIV infection led to an increase in CD8 T cell immune activation levels. Um, however, um, antagonist treatment here did not lead to any significant differences in the CD8 T cell immune activation levels. So as I showed earlier, though, immune activation is triggered by several different pathways, and um, other mechanisms such as the LPS stimulation of the TR4 might be contributing to the immune activation. So potentially, um, um, the, these other mechanisms might be stimulating enough CD8 T cell activation that the simple inhibition of a single pathway, the TLR7 pathway, may not be enough um, for us to see a reduction in immune activation in the CD8 T cells. So um, just to confirm that the antagonist was indeed successfully inhibiting the um, PDC uh, responses via TLR7, we then um, sacrificed the mice at nine weeks of infection and then came in again with the TLR7 and 8 in vitro stimulation. And this is without any further antagonist um, treatment. Um, so what we see here is that in the mice that did not have any antagonist treatment, we see high levels of um, both interferon alpha and TN alpha production by the PDCs. And then in the mice that were antagonist treated only in vivo, um, these uh, mice had no um, or re fairly uh, significantly reduced um, cytokine production by the PDCs, demonstrating that antagonist was in indeed successfully inhibiting this pathway. So um, to conclude, um, we've used the BLT mouse model um, to examine the effects of this TLR7 and 9 antagonists in, in a vivo um, HIV infection. And um, although it had no effect on HIV viral load, we saw a significant reduction in CD4 T cell activation. And then that um, this, act, this reduction was um, directly linked to an inhibition of um, TLR7 stimulation in the PDCs. So, as I mentioned, inhibition is not complete, and potentially other mechanisms are also contributing to immune activation. But we think this is still important because it can dissect out the various pathways that might be contributing uh, to the immune activation. And, and I think the BLT mouse model can be used to identify these specific pathways to allow for the development of treatment to target uh, the pathways contributing to immune activation, and then also be used as a method of trialing um, small molecules or, or a treatment in an in vivo model. Um, and then uh, potentially our hope is then to take the um, studies done in these BLT mouse models then into human trials um, with some of these small molecules. And so there's a lot of people I'd like to uh, thank, um, um, particularly in, in Marcus Altfeld's group, um, who did a lot of the work um, that I have shown here. And then, um, of course, um, to Todd Allen and, and Tim, who provided the virus. Um, Jeff Lisson, who provided the 82 virus. And um, Alan and Ron helped with all the statistical analysis. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the um, core that um, Andy runs with uh, Vlad and Ed providing us with um, the mice. And then um, Idea Pharmaceuticals provided us with the antagonist for this study, and of course, all of our um, funding agencies. Thank you. All right, we'll take some uh, questions. Jeremy. Judy, that was really cool. Um, I was curious um, if you could comment about um, some of these mediators from the mice themselves. So does the drug inhibit uh, signaling in the, the mouse? system as well, and could some of the activation be uh, a result of factors being activated in the, the mouse cells themselves? 
So we didn't examine too uh, extensively the activation of mouse-specific cells. We did um, go through and try to detect um, mouse interferon alpha to see if that was being stimulated by the HIV, and we didn't detect that. Um, so, but potentially there might be mouse in their immune cells that um, are being inhibited by the antagonist, but we haven't examined that at all. I would like to help Judy and say that interferon alpha is species specific and the signaling in cells very different and receptor very different. So, and I would like to congratulate Judy for beautiful work and uh, you very nicely highlight how important are CD38 expression on CD4 cells, not as on CD8 in terms of HIV pathogenesis. And I would like to give you one practical advice. If you are going to work with monocytoid lineage, go to the bone marrow. It's much easier to work. You will have much more cells. And because it's very well characterized, you can get on any population, on any stage of activation, and on any stage of maturation. And thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yes, on subsequent studies now, we're looking at um, um, cells in the liver, thymus, as well as in the bone marrow. So yeah. Very nice talk. Uh, I have uh, two related questions. One is, on this CD4 cell depletion over time, I, maybe I missed that. Do you see a difference in CD4 depletion over time? Uh, no. We, so we sacrifice at nine weeks, and I think most of the depletion starts at eight weeks. So we right. started, there seemed to be a slight decline by, by the time we were sacrificing, but it was not a significant decline. And so the, it was not significantly different between the antagonist treated and the non-antagonist treated mice. So what we observed was simply a reduction of the immune activation on the CD4 T cells, not a reduction in the cell population. Right, so in, in the, I probably won't talk about this this afternoon, but we have a, a PDC depleting antibody. When we deplete PDC, we reduce activation on both CD8 and CD4 T cell. And CD8 cells seem to be rescued that way. Maybe TOS 7 inhibited one aspect of PDC? Yeah, yeah. we can talk about it later. Yeah, no, that, that would be really great for discussion. Um, I mean, the inhibition is of TLR7 only, so we haven't examined, for example, any surface expression markers that might potentially be priming or activating the CD8 T cells. Hi. Um, for your interferon-positive PDCs in your mice, you had quite a range, and I wondered if you'd segregated that data into... Uh, male and female donors to see if you're seeing the same thing that's been reported in people. Yeah, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't gone through to see that. I think I, I spoke to Ed briefly when we were doing the studies and um, one of the things was um, I think the mice we were getting included both male and female mice and we weren't sure whether potentially there might be um, regulation by the mouse hormone system, but I think the donors were all males in the, these the batches of mice that we were looking at. So. Okay, you can do that though, can't you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah so I was wondering, what if you treat before the infection? <laughs> yeah, that's a question we get a lot. Um, I, I think, I think it, it's something that's gonna be really interesting. I think uh, PDC interferon alpha, production is sort of a double-edged sword. So we sort of present that here as a, a very negative factor, but interferon itself is actually a, a very good antiviral uh, um, cytokine. And so we think that early in infection that it actually might have some beneficial effects. So we think potentially if we block it before HIV comes in, that it might not actually be as desirable as um, later on where we don't want as much immune activation. But that's definitely something um, worth looking into. Hi, congratulations for your nice talk. Um, so I have a couple of questions. The first one is kind of related to the previous one. So not treating the, the mice before the infection, but maybe earlier, like just after the exposure of the HIV, do you think that that could kind of modulate the, the interferon response and therefore reduce somehow, but maintain the interferon uh, with an antiviral response in there and could help in the control of the virus? That could be my first question. Um, so I think potentially, I guess it depends on how fast the treatment comes in, that um, it potentially might help reduce immune activation, and therefore potentially reduce the um, CD4 target cells. Uh, but I think, you know, timing of that is going to be 
you know, hard to say when would be the best time to come in with it because then you're also removing this antiviral factor. And my second question is, have you tried to, to do the same kind of experiments blocking TLR8 or combining TLR8 antagonists with TLR7 and now see if you see like a more uh, significant effect? So we haven't done that. Um, I think the company does have a TLR antagonist, so potentially that's something we can uh, discuss with them um, as to whether the drugs can be combined. Um, there are chloroquine studies which um, block, uh, are able to block TLR7, 8, 9, as well as TLR3, um, and they have been shown, um, I think largely showing that there is a redu reduction in immune activation, but the results in those are, are still mixed, and I, I don't think the final sort of um, study results have come out for that. Thank you. So my question relates also to the last two questions. Um, I'm, I'm still a bit unclear on where this would come in uh, in treating a patient, particularly you mentioned at the beginning that even patients well controlled with heart therapy um, have early morbidity and mortality from other causes that you suggested might uh, be due to immune activation. But in those patients with good viral control, you actually would not think there would be much of the RNA that stimulates these TLRs around. and so. You wouldn't think that those would be the ones who might benefit from this. So um, in the people who are heart treated, I think people have shown that there is still low levels of HIV replication. And the PDC population is not large, and so I think we don't need a large amount of virus for there to be stimulation of this population. And so I think it can still contribute to decreasing the immune activation levels even in the setting of our control, just because there is still low levels of viral replication that's going feeding into this immune activation level. But we don't think this is something that could potentially be used on its own. I think um, a lot of other factors also contribute to the immune activation, so such as the microbial translocation. And I think potentially in combination with other treatments, then can be used to more comprehensively suppress the immune activation levels. So is global immune activation still a prominent feature in patients with really good viral suppression? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. So much. Um, I, 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 I want to thank the, uh, the organizers, uh, Mike Penziero, Todd Allen, and Andy Tager, for putting this uh, program together. I think we've gotten off to a great start. We're actually a little bit ahead of time, uh, which I think is important because it'll give us a half an hour to have a coffee break and really uh, follow up on some of the discussion, the great discussion that was started around these talks this morning. I also want to thank all four of the speakers for uh, really terrific talks and also for, uh, for staying on time to allow us to have the discussion that I think is the, the really uh, most important part of all of this. So thanks, everybody. We'll take a break. <laughs>